like to thank you all for being here for the second event of the seventh cycle of uh, debates of uh, technique system in a special edition to celebrate uh, 30 years of GSTEC and 10 years of uh, GSTEC NEET system. This morning, we're going to start with the debate challenges of the management of intellectual property and innovation in a public institution of research. For the innovation actions of a field crew, in order to receive the members of the panel, I would like to invite uh, the president of field crews, Paulo Cadelha. We'd also like to invite Dr. José Pernida from Bermudes, vice president of production, innovation, and health of, of, uh, at field crews. Would also like to invite Dr. Beatriz Amorim at the uh, Global Organization of the Intellectual Property. Would also like to invite Dr. Luis Otavio Pimentel, President of the National Institute of uh, Industrial Property. And would like to invite uh, Maria Celeste Simic. Coordinator of Technological Management at Rio Cruz. We'll give the floor to Dr. Luiz Otávio Pimentel. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to greet our honored uh, president of uh, Oswaldo Cruz, Paulo Gadelha, and I'd also like to greet Vice President of uh, Innovation and Production in Health, Professor George Bermudes, and also our uh, dear colleague from the Intellectual Property World Organization, Beatriz Maric, and also a special salute Greet to Maria Celeste, coordinator of technological management at Fiocruz, and greet everyone here and uh, have a special word for the, our colleagues at INPI, uh, Dr. Denise, and everyone else, all the other colleagues at uh, the institute that are here today. I'd like to also uh, greet. Professor Roberto Rotuf at Unicamp, Maria Elizabeth Rica dos Santos, and also on their behalf, I'd like to greet all of our colleagues present here. For us at uh, INPI, this is a very important moment because this event celebrates 30 years of the technological innovation nucleus at uh, Fiocruz, which is also coincidentally these 30 years uh, with the important moment in our recent history in terms of uh, health, industrial policies, and technological innovation. These last few years, 20 years, we've had uh, intellectual property uh, law that has been revised and other regulation standards with intellectual property that have been changed as well. We have also had some experience with the uh, innovation law in Brazil and also the update, the recent update of this standard. In this recent history, with uh, industrial policies to incentivate health and improve the technology of pharmaceutical pr products as well as other products related to health. Of course, Fiocruz has a very important role in this context and uh, also in the context of what we've been doing in our country in the sector, of course, at the innovation, technological innovation uh, center at Fiocruz also has a very important role because in the context of the organization of a Brazilian network of uh, 
technological innovation centers and sharing information in the management of intellectual property, especially industrial property, pat patents, and also the contracts of uh, technology transfer, and organi public organizations and institutions, um, science and technology instit institutes. Fiocruz has always been um, sharing their good experiences and practices, and uh, we have a very special team of very uh, smart people under the leadership and uh, partnership of um, our dear friend, Maria Celeste. We've had the opportunity when we created for Tech the forum to participate with her and other colleagues of ours to take part in this movement. And for that reason, we are very happy to be here with all of you celebrating 30 years of uh, Just Tech. And besides all that, I'd like to talk about INPI. We've always had a very important partnership with Fio Cruz and Gestec, a partnership that uh, has allowed us to uh, make advancements in areas that are very important, uh, writing uh, patents and uh, research in uh, patent documents and bringing more and more to our researchers. Uh, they are so important in this area of knowledge, especially health, the opportunity to move Brazil forward in terms of knowledge and also using these tools that are so important for the industry, for the health industry, as the patent documents. So I'd like to wish you all a good event, and I'd like to also greet president and the other managers at Phil Cruz for the excellent job they have been performing in the, at Gestec, this innovation group here. I'd like to congratulate you for this wonderful job you've been performing and uh, with the certainty that we will always move forward in this important theme, which is to improve our industry, especially health industry. Dr. Beatriz Amorim. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to greet uh, Professor Paulo Gadelha, Professor Bermudes, Dr. Pimentel, and also my dear friend Celeste. And I would also like to thank you for the invitation, having the privilege of being here celebrating the 30 years of GESTEC. And I think Celeste doesn't know, but when I got into this intellectual property theme, I came from innovation science technology. And uh, when I got here, I was doubtful. I didn't know why I would have an important role in the context of intellectual property. At the time, I was invited to work at INPI. And uh, five times I said no. And the invitation came from a good lawyer, and the good lawyer finally convinced me to do it, and I ended up at INPI. And I, uh, at that time, INPI was uh, very uh, focused on uh, registrations of patents, which was the main thing of the institute. And I didn't think that it was a place fit for someone that came from innovation. And uh, Celeste, she doesn't know about that, but uh, during a meeting, uh, the first meeting that I had uh, when I arrived at intellectual property, I heard the sociologist talking about intellectual property in a meeting, the meeting of a network that seemed a little strange to me. Uh, until that moment, I had heard about uh, technology transfer and the very little, almost nothing of intellectual property. So Celeste was the first person who made me hopeful that it would be possible to have a few links. And it's something that I can do between both themes, uh, intellectual property and uh, technology innovation. 
uh, transfer. Thank you very much, Celeste and just tag. I'd like to thank you for that and professionally too, because I think that the challenges of those who work with intellectual property, trying to make the theme being understood in the context of uh, innovation is a daily challenge because sometimes this theme is isolated and uh, we see it caught up in its legal application, which is very important, but it's an economical theme. It's a, something that must be understood in the context of uh, innovation strategy. Innovation has become a word that's used in all kinds of contexts, whether they are developing countries or uh, under development, uh, all countries, when they face crisis, they see how important it is to innovate. The developing countries try to establish their strategies, their innovation, and the property intellect uh, strategies in order to be able to skip phases and uh, be competitive in the socioeconomic uh, system. And it's important to understand well the system and use the intellectual property system in their innovation context, which is important. And I think that just tech in their 30 years, they've had a very important role that they have been performing, not only around Fiu Cruz or only in Brazil. I'd like to, on behalf of uh, the World Organization, Intellectual Property Organization, I'd like to thank you all for your constant cooperation supporting other countries in their political structuring and institutional structuring countries that seek thinking about uh, public policies in this field and institutions at these countries that try to establish their strategies, their institutional rules and strategies in order to rule intellectual property in the innovation context. And uh, besides that, we've been having a very important role in supporting uh, the training of uh, managers, not only in Brazil, uh, Funesp is a very great protagonist uh, with, and uh, I don't know how many years, I think 10 years or more. And then later on at Fortec, they've been uh, generously contributing and sharing their knowledge with uh, other actors in Brazil and also outside Brazil. And uh, quite often, WIPO counts on uh, Fio Cruz and just take it with the view that Fio Cruz has facing a great challenge, which is balancing access and protection. Access, which is very important, especially in developing countries due to their socioeconomical policies and protection that the system, of course, uh, needs to be protected and in, in incentivate, foster creativity, but not be a barrier. And uh, I would like to talk later on a little more. And I would like to thank you for your invitation and for the privilege of being here. And I'm at your disposal to carry on with my partnership with Fio Cruz. Thank you very much. Maria Celeste Merik. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to greet the representatives at the table, our president, Paulo Gadelha. Thank you for your support during these eight years of management, uh, vice president, for supporting uh, the systems in these last few years. And I'd like to thank and greet our representative of uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization for her generous words. I think that I realized that I had to have a different tone with this uh, conversation since I'm a sociologist trying to analyze a micro, micro, micro strategy and see what is uh, what kind of strategies the system has. Thank you very much, Beatriz. And I'd like to also read our INPI partner, uh, and I joke with him 
often saying that we have to know what we are doing. So he is a partner that helps us align our strategies all the time. Thank you very much. And dear colleagues, I'd like to greet this audience. You don't know how great it is uh, for me to do that. Uh, we have our vice president at the table. We have our vice president of uh, teaching and also our vice president at management and research, Rodrigo Stavli. We uh, have, uh, it's a great honor to have you here to celebrate our 30 years. But this audience, almost without exceptions, is responsible for everything that we're going to present today and this afternoon, the highlights we're going to have. I learned a little bit about what, what, what my great qualities were. It was in this institution that I learned that because of the room they gave me. And from the beginning, I managed to see how we could bring together all these actions during these 30 years, work jointly with people from different sectors and institutions. And a small part is represented here. We had much more people that wouldn't be able to fit in this 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 uh, theater, if we had invited all of the contributors from the north region of the country and the south, east, southeast, uh, all of the leadership, we talked to them uh, constantly. And we have lots of these representatives here in this audience, such as both Pukki universities from Rio de Janeiro and Rio Grande do Sul are here. President of Technology, Angela Rua, and uh, also several IMPI representatives from other public entities as well. Reinaldo Ferraz, uh, who has uh, 30 years of partnership with IMCI, which has been an important partner with uh, for inter working on behalf of intellectual property in this country. We managed to transform Bolsaheim into technology, and we've been able to bring two people to the team. And that's how these years have been. Here we have uh, ex-presidents, uh, uh, Akira Homa, a great partner in the vaccination diagnosis uh, area. Uh, without him, Just Tech wouldn't have been able to do so much. Our vice presidents uh, here, we have Cavaliero. We thank you very much for your president for your presence. It's kind of risky to keep mentioning names. We have lots of dear people here, lots of partners. And I'd also like to talk about our business secretary of Embrata, who's here with us today as well. With, uh, we have lots of representatives from uh, health ministry and other institutions as well. And our dear friend from Just Technique, which now has 89 uh, contributors. Working hard to transform this knowledge is something that can change the society. Would like to thank you very much, the knowledge generators that have been here. We have lots of representatives here this morning and the afternoon. I'm sure you're going to have more. Uh, and without them, there is no reason for JSTAC to be to exist. This uh, innovation uh, center and in the United States. They call it uh, technology transfer office. The business is something that we have to do with highly complexity. Uh, and uh, we, it demands a very organized organization facing challenges so that we may be able to contribute into something that will transform it into product. We have this house uh, at the disposal of this house, a team that's highly specialized and prepared to discuss about the future of this specialty in this institution. And uh, if we have a well-oiled machine with a lot of parts of this, com this uh, institution working well, in decision making and other things. It's not easy to work with the intellectual property system. It was created in the end of the 19th century in the private sector view. In order to deal with that in the public sector, we have to have great skills and everybody who deals with that knows that, especially in the health innovation system, because this industry in this context is so delicate and so complex. 
and it's very complex to transform knowledge into technology such as equipment and we also would like to highlight the knowledge of uh, educational and social impact that this comp this institution has with the Brazilian public health system so that's all I have to say welcome everyone we hope to have a great day and we'll be able to squeeze in two hours, in, uh, until two, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, what we've talked about here, the, la the timeline, uh, I think will be interesting to see and to be able to pay homage to all of these partners. We can't pay homage to all of them, but I hope that you all feel uh, this, uh, th that we paid homage to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear Gedelia, President of Fia Cruz, the pr Vice President Ligia Lima, Rodrigo Stabri and Pedro Barbosa, Walter Rangel, our colleagues, directors, friends, guests, and those that we're going to pay tribute to in the afternoon, Luis Eduardo Pimentel, Beatriz Amarim, who went to Geneva. Actually, she came from Geneva, and and she's back there now. And my dear Celeste, uh, first of all, it's really a pleasure to see again many of our friends here, and uh, review our history. And what's good about this new cycle of discussions is that it represents a, something special uh, by celebrating the uh, ten. 10th anniversary of the system. Our focus has always been on strengthening the system, strengthening Fucrus's units, and decentralizing our activities, as well as maintaining some relevant activities and monitoring the system from up close. The subject selected for the route table this morning couldn't be more timely. Global scale, the challenges of intellectual property and innovation in a public institution are of extreme strategic importance. And even though innovation, especially for the industries, is closely related to intellectual property, we also have the other side of the coin that we need to take into account since we are a relevant public institution both for health for health and for science and technology and as Beatrice Samarim said uh, access to technologies as a fundamental human right is of the utmost importance so to us looking for this balance between innovation and public health has been a constant struggle globally speaking especially at the WHO and at in several uh, different levels and it was recently taken to the core of the United Nations with a high level panel nominated by uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, whose report was published last week, and I had the honor to be one of its 16 members. Intellectual property has been seen and needs to be seen and discussed both as an incentive to education, but also as a possible hindrance to the access to new technologies and drugs, as well as other barriers such as regulation and new prices of new products, which have nothing to do with the costs of new products which make for inaccessible products and technologies to the population and also inaccessible to health systems. Among the results of the high-level panel, in addition to having taken this subject to the level of the United Nations, we also highlighted the fact that today access to technologies is no longer a problem restricted to low or medium income. It's a problem that high-income high countries also face, which on one hand put the current system at check and countries such as France, the United States, and the United Kingdom have been referring to new technologies as being cost-effective, but ones that cannot be 
paid for by the system due to their high costs or high prices. So uh, we also intend to take this discussion towards discussing a new a new global milestone in an environment that tries to dissociate intellectual property from the price of the product or dissociating patents uh, from the need to reimburse uh, expenditures from the final price of products. And we all know, and we've been seeing more recently, the recent progress that was achieved in the treatment of hepatitis C and cancer, but we all know that these new treatments would be impossible to pay for, even in countries such as France, the United States, or UK, much less in Brazil. So I'm sure that at the end of this day today, that was carefully planned by Gestec, uh, will be at the same time, revering the past of our last 30 years of history at Fia Cruz, uh, at the same time, we'll have a very good start with this round table where Beatrice Zamorim, Isabel Boko, and uh, Marley Ritter uh, will be discussing current themes that will be important for both today and tomorrow. I'm sure we're going to have a very fruitful day in terms of discussions and in terms of uh, setting the path to the future. Welcome and thank you for being here. Good morning. This is undoubtedly a very special date and I think that uh, here we have a confluence of not only central aspects related to rethinking the development of a country, but also a huge array of subjects that are milestones in the development of this institution. I'd like to greet uh, Luis Pimentel, Beatriz Amorim, uh, Jorge Bermudis, and Vice President uh, Nisi Lima, Pedro Barbosa, and Rodrigo Stabli. Uh, Lancreas is in Brasilia representing us at the Commission of the Ministry uh, for Sanitary Emergencies, which is another subject. Uh, the technological management was intensely discussed. Uh, we have the presence here among us of Rodrigo Perez, one of our colleagues in partnerships, a very successful partnership in this chain of innovation that started with research in Manguinhos that produced results uh, that is uh, that are one of the uh, relevant targets of this product uh, to deal with the vectors responsible for these epidemics that we're seeing. I'd also like to greet several of the directors who are here, Hermano, Reiner, Sergio, I mean, Akira, ex-president, uh, who is an icon, as Sergio said, an icon of this construction of, of something that, on the one hand, is the most successful, one of the most successful things in Brazil, the PNI, with its uh, successful database of production and research and technology as based around Manguinhos. And as the president of Fia Cruz, he had this extraordinary role from the point of view of growing this area. I always remember how Akira, in all of our discussions, not only about uh, modeling, but also about careers, how he would discuss the importance of perceiving the innovation chain and the differences of uh, complementarity and the specificity of technology and production. Celeste, I'd also like to greet her, who represents a, due to her enthusiasm, dedication, and her capacity 
to bring together both externally and internally a series of players related to this field. And Celeste, uh, she came and went several times. She went to Unicab and she came back to a few crews. Uh, but I mean, the presence of the guests here uh, is in and of itself a proof of uh, Celeste's management. And I'd also like to agree everybody who is here uh, Fia Cruz is proud of its results, even though it has many challenges moving forward. And I'd also like to mention something who's very special, uh, Marilia. And she's always uh, moving her hands, asking how, how. Uh, we all know what it meant, Marilia, with Aroca, this contemporary period of Fia Cruz. And this process started with Aroca. And Marilia was. A, a big, um, an important mentor of what we have 30 years later of the uh, growth of the Technet system. When uh, it comes to a 30 year history, I was thinking, well, uh, this uh, patent and IP subject. Uh, can was was first seen both as something positive and as a problem since the very beginning of this institution and the beginning of, of the 1900s when this institution was created to solve problems and to focus its work on bringing about responses especially in the field of health uh, it was able to develop a product which was a vaccine and this vaccine that was extremely important from the point of view of veterinary production was the main pillar that gave sustainability to a project that used to be uh, restricted in terms of uh, how it could respond to epidemics and sanitary emergencies. And after that, it became a permanent process of transformation in Fear Cruz. And we were left with this uh, question. We could no longer use the so-called uh, directly uh, funded resources. So the resources that were used for the vaccine uh, were no longer uh, resources that could be used by the institution. And we were left with the question, uh, who does this vaccine belong to? Um, and that was summarized uh, in a mini crisis at the institution, so to speak. And it's interesting to think that now we have a much more complex situation and that the uh, professional training processes and the need for us to think about the uh, innovation chain as a whole, thinking about uh, technology uh, also means prospection. We have several different cases, for instance, where uh, we could uh, be placing our bets on a process of developing technologies or internalizing and transferring technology. And after a certain time, we simply notice that all of our efforts were uh, to no avail because a new technology, a new possibility appears and we were not ready for failure. Uh, that was something that uh, we observed in the case of hepatitis, for instance. So this field, uh, which is, as I said, uh, much more complex now, uh, these 30 years of history taught Fia Cruz, along with the society, both uh, Brazilian and global, uh, it taught us that uh, this is something clear to us in the healthcare sector. Uh, we have uh, our uh, goals, uh, which is uh, universal access to health uh, written in the Constitution, and it will become a utopia if we do not have a solid domestic national basis that is able 
to support us with the capacity to respond to this huge array of possibilities that are set forth by the unified health system. And it's it won't be possible for us to do it if we do not have an extremely com competent and modern process uh, that's able uh, to leverage uh, our possibilities in uh, the national unified health system. And this uh, led Fear Cruz to a process that's inscribed in the policies of state, which was the conception of the uh, economic and industrial con complex of health. Why do I say that? We have to think that when Fiocruz starts evolving in the field of technological management, this meant a lot of things. Uh, back in the day, it meant a significant change in culture from the perspective of knowledge producers. Knowledge producers, out of tradition, they saw their recognition and acknowledgement among their peers and in the uh, national uh, acknowledgement system. Uh, it, this acknowledgement occurred through their publications, and there was very little understanding that this production of knowledge should be involved with the innovation chain. So this is a huge evolution, being able to uh, reshape this at Fia Cruz and in for the Brazilian society. But what's the most significant thing for us is that a very special challenge was the fact that over the course of the past 15 years, I would say, the fact that Brazil built a new place for health in the process of innovation, innovating and leveraging um, development models and the production bases in Brazil. This change of having the Ministry of Health as an anchor with integrated policies with all of the ministries, the MCTI, uh, the MDIC, and all of the ministries, uh, and uh, of understanding that health can induce a development model that's virtuous from the perspective of uh, leveraging economic development and of responding to social demands, this led health to take on a main role in this process. And Fia Cruz, uh, being an institution of the Ministry of Health, was summoned. And at the same time, it positioned itself and geared up to try to build in an increasingly more consolidated manner, an innovation system in the country. And this brought about um, huge challenges. And it's uh, these challenges that we'll be reviewing in this 30-year process. In the following panel, we're going to have very significant contributions. And I'm sure that uh, the words that of those that preceded me have already shown you the complexity of this subject. It's a subject that requires a high level of professional training at all levels, and it also requires clarity as to when intellectual property or the patent will be a hindrance or a stimulus, uh, as Georgie said. I mean, uh, we've gone through very crucial moments in this process uh, during uh, the administration of Minister Sarah. Uh, we had uh, this uh, situation with uh, Favirenza uh, retroviral that was fundamental to be the basis of a very successful program, which is our AIDS control program. And back then, intellectual property and the uh, patent of the product would prevent due to an economic abuse prevented us from giving access to the Brazilian population to something fundamental. And it was back then that uh, by using the resources, and Brazil was very important in that it uh, gave flexibility to uh, the patent process. It started actually with Minister Serra, and then it was followed by Minister Temporal. The resource of placing sanitary interests, uh, whether it is for uh, compul compulsory uh, licenses or uh, for breaking the patent, above everything else. 
So uh, today we're going to be working on all of these aspects. It's something that's fundamental for Brazil and fundamental for health. And it's something that's at the core of our institution because here, uh, not only due to the mission of the institution and due to the matrix and organization of our institution, it's an institution that's unique. It can uh, go through the entire process of vertical innovation in that you can start with a bench study and uh, come up with a survey at uh, Biomanguinhos, for instance, and at the same time, due to the competencies that it acquired over time in its learning process, and it also learned each one of the chains, uh, each one of the links of this, the, this chain, so this is at the core of our institutional life, and JESTEC and the JESTECNIC systems have a strategic fundamental role in that we are uh, celebrating and challenging and making prospections for the future. Uh, congratulations to all of us, and we're going to have extremely fruitful morning and afternoon sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, now we're going to move forward. Well, good morning, everyone, once again. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to share a video with all of you. It was recently put together, and it seemed to be very illustrative because it talks about the global innovation and intellectual property. I don't know if I'd have to turn off the lights. I believe so. Coffee is cultivated in Colombia, roasted in Italy. Shaving foam from China. Shaver from Japan. The towel manufactured in Turkey. Shirt with uh, cotton from Egypt, buttons from France. Jacket made in New Zealand. Shoes with uh, uh, laces from Brazil made in Mexico. Manufacturing in the United Kingdom, glasses, plastic from China, designed from Italy, bicycle, wheels from the United States, elevator door from the United States and other parts from China, paper, manufacturing in Indonesia, pencil, graffiti from Mexico, products from Alexandria, the United States and China. Concept from Switzerland, developed in India. Architecture from Argentina. Plant from Chile, designed in Switzerland. Well, it's just to make us reflect on ch productive chains and this concept, the sentence that has always been there in our lives, made in some part of the world, some product, and also the services, the origins. Now, the made in is just the end of a process of a whole produ production chain, and innovation has become 
a process that even more complex. It has always been complex, but now the challenge is to have innovation within this uh, production chain. And uh, some concepts are new to the economists and the policy makers. Uh, the challenge now with by uh, SDA is to quantify the global uh, chain and not only look at uh, traditional indicators such as the GDP or the number of patents that is an uh, isolated indicator. It doesn't measure innovation. So all of these economists' challenges bring us new terms such as uh, value global value chain. And I'd like to show as uh, just by curiosity, I'd like to bring to you if we analyze the the story of search, Google search about the, the value chain in the 80s, it didn't used to exist. And nowadays, the amount has grown up so much, you can see how popular terms, ideas and concepts become more popular. So the value chains and the global chains have become an obsession in terms of where to have you company position in your country position and if we get this term that's not very nice but let's say if it cost uh, $425 in the market it would certainly be a good brand good design and a lot of uh, elements that add value to it and only 9% of it of the product would be associated to manufacturing and 91% of the product would be adding value in the pre-manufacturing phase or post-manufacturing phase, which is where the publicity, marketing, post-sales services are. And it's just to show you a little bit of a context of how important it is to have uh, untenable uh, assets in the value chain. If we analyze uh, history in the post-war, we had two poles of protagonists in the world, uh, Europe and the United States in terms of economic growth and also in terms of innovation. In the post-war, Japan became a new important actor, but in the 80s, other countries from the Asian Southeast also joined. And then later we had emerging players from uh, international trade. Uh, they had that role not only in terms of in innovation. And here in this slide, I'd like to show you a few interesting data. For example, the purchase power of the emerging countries. If we compare from 2000 to 2012, it grew from 39 to 53%. And uh, world exportation went from 34% to 47% in 2011. So international trade became more important for these countries. The GDP also grew when we compare the 60s and 90s. It used to grow at an average of 1.5%. And between 2000 and 2010, it grew to 4.7. And when we analyze the foreign direct investments, it grew both in terms of uh, investments that arrived to the emerging countries as the investments that are also made from the emerging countries to other countries with their globalized companies. So within this context, I'd like to bring your attention to something over here. I'm not only talking about the health sector, I'm talking in general. And then later on, we could uh, reflect upon the implications that this panorama may have in the health sector and others. It's a great challenge uh, to bring access and protection, and I'd like to make it clear that this data, uh, this is uh, trade and innovation data from all sectors. But I'd also like to bring your attention to this new movement of uh, innovation, which is global. And I'd like to show you two phenomena. This 
appearance of uh, global companies that come out of uh, emerging countries. Brazil has theirs. Other countries have their own, like China, India, and they become stable and they start to expand these companies uh, abroad. And a lot of them are not going to be only uh, located in their own countries, but in the other countries as well. Another interesting phenomena is the attraction of global centers to emerging countries. At UFRJ, which is the Rio de Janeiro University, their technological park had lots of uh, centers, uh, uh, R&D centers, uh, and uh, All that has implications for the innovators and actors in the innovation chain in the countries. And in, or, and in order to be able to do the technology and knowledge management in the productive chain, it's essential. So when we analyze uh, global companies from emerging companies, this is a survey that examined the 100 biggest countries, uh, companies in the world in 63 different sectors. In 2009, from the 100, 18 came from emerging countries. In 2014, went up to 25. A few of them uh, are some that we know. They come from different countries. And if we see the 100 greatest companies, uh, Latin America in 2014 had 23, and most of them are Chinese and uh, Indian. But Latin America has a reasonable number as well. And this map here shows the distribution of these R&D centers, where they are located outside their origin country. So of course, the concentration is great in North America and Europe, and also in the south of Asia. There's a very reasonable, meaningful number of centers. And India has lots of R&D centers that attract this new actor, because if we analyze history, it's not about multinationals research, searching for uh, cheap labor and uh, natural resources, but they are global companies searching talent and how to work in the technological center that is already established. Between 2000 and 2015, the number of R&D throughout the world in emerging economies grew five times, and the R&D centers in Europe, United States, and Japan has only become stable. So here, unfortunately, the numbers can't be seen very well, but the first table here, actually, they are tables, they are the product of the study made by two Indian men who tried to map the contribution of Indian talents in the global innovation uh, field. So here in the first table, we have lots of multinationals and the number of pat patents by these multinationals between 2011 and 2016. And the next column, how many Indian inventors took part in these patents in the multinationals? GE, which is the top one that produced about 30,000 patents in this period of time, they have uh, around uh, 2,000 Indian inventors. There's another center in Bangalore, which is very famous and very uh, active. It's interesting to analyze how this center operates. And GE Center is now they generate uh, inventions. They are focused on the local market. but. For example, there's a very famous uh, invention uh, that has been invented by G by Indian men, uh, people, which is for uh, EKG, which the focus was on the rural areas of India because it don't have power and it's easily carried around. That was patented by the center in India and it uh, became uh, an innovation 
that was only changing the shape of equipment that was already known. But this equipment also became important in the United States, especially for the emergency uh, medical personnel, who paramedics who work on roads and they can't have access to medical centers. So this innovation that was developed by GE in India started being used by the United States. The patent was a priority of India, and uh, there was then a contribution by India through a multinational to the original market of this multinational. So I'd just like to show you the complexity of our current scenario. The second table here shows the number of patents uh, by international uh, multinational uh, Indian companies and we have here Humbax and some farmer who they are companies that uh, last year got together they merged and there's a number of patents outside India which is uh, the number of the Indian multinationals which shows you a little bit about how they contrib contribute with their talents. And uh, now I'd like to show you a reference with this slide, which is a study that tried to categorize the kinds of interactions, the kind of uh, R&D models that are used nowadays in the world. So the axis in the bottom shows it measures the intensity intensity of cooperation, and the other axis shows the capacity of internationalization of the R&D centers. So that center on the on the side are the most globalized ones and more intense in terms of cooperation. Usually, they are uh, highly innovative global products, and the study shows that uh, most of the pharmaceutical companies would be placed in that kind of model. And below that, if we look at the first one, the first model, it's a closed innovation model where everything is done in the company. And uh, over there on the axis, we see the first stages of open uh, innovation. And up there, we have the multi-node R&D, which is the, the several R&D nodes without any connection. They are usually uh, products that are strongly uh, geared towards the internal market. For example, L'Oreal, Johnson Johnson, they establish their own centers in order to be able to manufacture products that uh, meet the demand, the local demand. Brazil, as we all know, is also participating in this movement, as published on the Financial Times in 2014. It became an international research and development center, or hub. But what opportunities are the international investors looking for? Well, that's more or less clear. They want to improve the efficiency in R&D. They want to have access to local talents and have access to the infrastructure of those countries. Emerging countries, four of them, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, increased the number of universities in the ranking. In 2013, there were 18 universities in that ranking. In 2015, 40 universities of the best global universities. And there are indicators that point towards the fact that these countries do have infrastructure and capacity to attract these centers. There's also interest in access to supplemental knowledge. I mean, uh, the fact is these uh, R&D centers of global companies have uh, great clarity as to why they are going to move towards these locations. Uh, those who receive it would have access to the technological frontier, possibility to intensify uh, learning in uh, technology, opportunities to establish strategic, strategic partnerships and strengthen the innovation ecosystem. That will only happen, though, if there is a strategy. Otherwise, it will only be an additional episode where uh, only one side gains or wins and the other side uh, simply stands there watching a unique strategy being implemented. And here I draw your attention to the fact that this movement of internationalization 
led the North American government to a specific concern. First, if the level of security of uh, intellectual property rights in those countries is adequate. And second, if the strategies of protection of American companies outside of the U.S. would have or have what type of strategies they would have uh, to prioritize protection and how they would approach the IP generated in those centers not located in the U.S. And that's in a report of the National Science Foundation. Whenever I think about strategies, and in this case, I read about uh, what the North American government was writing, and I was thinking if in Latin America the uh, same concern exists if the countries are getting ready uh, to have strategies and uh, to make the survival of international hubs uh, be something that will uh, be beneficial to the ecosystem of a nation, or is that only being approached passively as as simply the fact that only by having R&D centers in these countries uh, that in and of itself would lead to benefits to the innovation centers. I think that's an important discussion to have. In many countries, I don't think it's present. The innovation production chain today, in addition to receiving these international companies with, its, with their R&D centers, they also have other centers of R&D, as we'll hear from the Pasteur Institute, and they're present in several countries in South America and Uruguay and other countries, and we'll learn more about the strategies. But there are uh, yet another element in that chain, and it's important that we learn about the strategies of everybody who comprises these uh, chains so that we can make profit of this movement of internationalization. Uh, there are other institutes and other ones present in Chile, Brazil, and the Northeast, if I'm not mistaken. So this entire movement is, in reality, what, to me, what is crucial is to establish strategies for this reality to be beneficial to the priorities of social economic development of the countries. And here I apologize for only uh, bringing patent numbers, uh, but uh, I want to make it clear that patents are one of the indicators in the innovation process. They're not the only one. Uh, the OMP uh, publishes every year uh, the global innovation rate in July. And when they publish along with the Cornell University, when they collect numbers from uh, along with their partners, they try to understand the complexity of the innovation process. That is, increasing the uh, number of indicators and not only having the traditional indicators, uh, such as R&D investment and numbers of scientists. Uh, that's all part of one of the pillars of the uh, index, but the index is much more than that. Um, there's online access to any of you who uh, wishes to access uh, the index. But the least important thing, in my opinion, is the ranking. Of course, all the countries are eager to know where they are uh, when they publish uh, the ranking, but that's the least important thing, in my opinion. The most important thing in the Global Innovation Index is the, the fact that it's comprised of seven pillars. And these seven pillars uh, look into 80 two indicators and looking into these 82 indicators and being able to figure out the strengths and weaknesses of each country that's its biggest contribution to policy making and to business strategy so 
if you access the index, please, uh, it indicates the strengths and the weaknesses, and I think that that's where it contains the most important information. For instance, uh, the strength of Brazil, as you know, is its capacity to produce knowledge and uh, the high quality of absorption and production of knowledge. There are other problems, for instance, the business environment, uh, opera operating in the business environment in Brazil is pointed out as a weakness, for instance. Uh, here are some numbers. These are uh, uh, curves showing the mechanisms of protection uh, between 2000 and 2014. It's a rising curve showing that with the increasingly more intense commerce, the intellectual property system, which is a system that, as Celeste mentioned, uh, dates back to the 19th century, um, it, it is still a system that's used to formalize the intense exchange that occurs between the players. The PCT is a treaty managed by the OMP. It's a uh, patent cooperation treaty, and every year numbers are published about uh, patents in the PCT. I want to draw your attention, attention to China. In spite of the Chinese numbers being very complicated for us to compare against their economies, I want to call your attention to the fact that China in 1999 I was at uh, the National Intellectual Property Institute, and we received this Chinese delegation of at least 20 people to visit the institute, and maybe Edemir remembers that, and to see, to learn how it operated. They were on a tour to get to know the institutions, and a year later, I had access to the intellectual property strategy of China. Obviously, uh, when speaking about China, we cannot compare it not only due to its numbers, but also due to its political system. Uh, when, when, when something's decided, uh, they don't discuss it with anybody. They simply do it, and that's much more complex than a democratic system that we're used to. And this, uh, the price of democracy is worth paying. Uh, so the case of China is also very specific in that regard. But China, three years ago, was not even in that group, and now it has surpassed Germany. Uh, when it comes to uh, patents in China, many people say, well, but the quality is poor. But really, the strategy of China was let's learn uh, to write patents, which is not something trivial. Years ago, I heard from an American colleague, and I didn't understand why because it was very critical. I'm still is, but anyway, uh, she was like, we have to protect it, we have to protect it as if it were, uh, as if writing patents and uh, presenting patents was a learning process, and that was the perspective of this North American company, uh, North American colleague, and that was also the perspective of Chinese, of course, uh, with that, uh, many poor quality patents are written. That's a fact. The number of patents today, the Chinese office is the one with the highest number of patents having surpassed the American office. But these patents have a different destination and they'll become international. And therefore, the uh, quality, when we look at the PCT, it, quality is an, an element that's much more present than uh, if I showed you numbers related to uh, the uh, Chinese IPCI. Uh, the areas uh, that are uh, most frequently mentioned in the PCT, most of them belong to informatics and telecommunications. And it's interesting because Samsung's director in a presentation the other day said that uh, Samsung, Samsung has a new release every five days, one product taken out of the portfolio every 10 days, and the average duration of the product is 10 months. So what's the reason? Why do these companies have so many patents? Because they're valid for 20 years. Uh, the concession process will not be enough. And I'm not talking about uh, the uh, Brazilian in, uh, Intellectual Property Institute that has uh, problems with deadlines, but it's a process that generates backlogs. Uh, patent office in the biotech area uh, 
on average, they work with the four-year uh, period. So there's a paradox to this. And of course, this is also part of a few uh, criticisms that are made to the system because what occurs is that some companies already negotiate with a portfolio of requests and a few patents and this capacity uh, to present a powerful portfolio make negotiations, uh, go towards one side or another. This is an effort uh, towards putting China along with the other emerging economies in the same graph in 2014. The difference between India and the others is already quite significant. For Latin America and the Caribbean, in Latin America and the Caribbean, they also grow in the PCT on average 35 percent between 2000 and 2015. And the 20 uh, biggest uh, patent uh, requesters uh, are here. There are uh, six universities, one uh, fostering agency, even though we are not in the PCT, uh, they use PCT for international protection and a public company that is in Brapa. Twelve out of the uh, 20 biggest uh, patent requesters from the Latin American region come from Brazil. Uh, in 2004, they published this study about uh, the uh, main requesters in Brazil, and back then Unicamp was ahead of Petrobras. I don't know if I don't know how the map at the INPI, the National Intellectual Property Institute, looks like today. But I want to call your attention to the fact that it's good that universities become aware that part of the knowledge that they produce deserves a different destination in terms of management. That might be good news, but the fact that so many universities are among the biggest requesters, uh, this shows or indicates an immature management system that should be dealt with. Well, a summary of my take-home message, intangibles are considered key assets. There is an open innovation model of intense collaboration. There's also the need of a mechanism that's able to formalize these intense relations between companies and between companies and universities and companies with the R&D, uh, small, large companies, domestic and international, with the human element, both to create and to manage this knowledge. And to create, I think Brazil already established a good uh, science and technology infrastructure. But I want to call your attention to the importance of training people for intellectual property and technology transfer areas. Oftentimes, these aspects are not clear in the innovation public policies. They come, for instance, in the law of innovation from 2004, uh, the obligation to create needs. Uh, however, no one thought uh, where they would come from, if there will be a career for this type of professional. And actually, now there is a fact, several needs, over 250, over 300 often operating with few professionals uh, having strategies to survive and train their workforce. But it's fundamental that not only knowledge creation is a priority, but also how to manage it and how to train and how to build capacity among people that should also be front and center uh, when it comes to discussing the innovation ecosystem. In December 2014, I read on a newspaper the following sentence, the problem seems to be the incapability to transform inventions into commercial products. Uh, that's 
probably a problem related to several NIDs in Brazil, how to build the bridges, how to transfer. Uh, this was also mentioned. Um, uh, how to go from the idea to the market, but that sentence referred to Europe. Uh, Europe has uh, this problem, and uh, to a higher or lower degree, technology is present not only in Latin America, uh, this technology-related problem, but also in the U.S. If you listen to the universities, they have several similar problems. However, in a much bigger context and with much better infrastructure that may make it easier to find solutions to this challenge. Since we in Latin America are quite creative and we should look for solutions that are in line with our context, uh, context and with our challenges. I leave you with this sa sentence uh, by Eric Hobsbawm, uh, who said that no one who uh, knows South America resists uh, the region. It's a laboratory of historical changes made to destroy all conventional truths. Uh, so hopefully you're going to have a lot of energy and that just tag will break many paradigms and contribute its own models to public health, which is a special sector in terms of global innovation, and that you're still able to share the good experiences and best practices with other countries in Latin America. So once again, thank you for your partnership. Thank you. Hello, bom dia. Eu fui apresentada mais cedo. Eu sou responsável pela parceria industrial e transferência de tecnologia, eu gostaria de primeiro agradecer a vocês por ter me convidado e eu gostaria de dizer também que eu fiquei muito impressionada porque tem tanta expertise aqui em termos de propriedade intelectual, transferência de tecnologia e inovação, que eu me sinto um pouco desconfortável Então, eu escolhi apresentar para vocês como que o Instituto Pasteur se reorganizou, o que nós fizemos em termos de, da nossa missão na questão de desenvolver, eu diria, a nossa transferência de tecnologia e parceria industrial, porque é muito importante. Então... Como foi dito no programa, nós nos focamos mais em como organizamos o, a, o Instituto Pasteur e a diferença entre a propriedade intelectual, inovação e transferência de tecnologia. Eu acho que muitas das questões levantadas pelas pessoas anteriores a mim no palco foram muito importantes porque frequentemente na mente das pessoas e também na mente de cientistas existe uma mistura entre a propriedade intelectual, transferência de tecnologia e parceria industrial. É um processo, mas dependendo da missão, do instituto, ou o que nós queremos como objetivo, é uma coisa muito diferente. E eu acho que isso foi muito bem ilustrado na palestra anterior. E eu gostaria de falar agora duas palavras sobre o que nós fazemos na questão mais prática no PASTE. Então, como vocês sabem, o Pasteur foi um, uma pessoa interessante, ele foi famoso porque ele desenvolveu o que nós chamamos de ciência aplicada. Ele foi, um, eu diria, um, um, um empreendedor na maneira de pensar e muitas pessoas, depois do Pasteur, tentam é, seguir a sua missão. Então, o que é interessante também é que no passado, 120 anos, como vocês podem ver aqui, muitas das pesquisas fundamentais dos institutos Pasteur se tornaram produtos. E quando eu digo produtos, eu não estou necessariamente falando sobre dinheiro, mas sim pacientes e é, executar produtos, entregar produtos ao ao setor de saúde. E uma coisa também que muitas pessoas não percebem é que o Instituto Pasteur foi um dos 
uma das primeiras é, startup companies, empresas de startup na, na França, porque eles não podiam, não conseguiam financiamento do governo. E, então, eles tiveram que ir ao mundo inteiro é, para conseguir investimentos para abrir o Instituto Pasteur. E naquele momento, ele realmente queria ter um setor de saúde, um centro de pesquisa e de treinamento. E essa era a missão do Pasteur. E nós ainda temos isso até hoje em dia. Essas missões não são somente ferramentas de marketing interessantes, porque todos falam de missão e declaração do que é a missão. Ela realmente foi implementada e reforçada no Instituto Pasteur hoje em dia. Nós somos, antes de mais nada, centros de pesquisa biomédicos. Nós estamos concentrados na pesquisa. Todas as pesquisas que terminam num processo de tecnologia de transferência, quando você faz uma pesquisa clínica, você também tem essa palavra pesquisa, então as pessoas podem fazer esse tipo de pesquisa, não para transferir isso como um produto, mas simplesmente para entender a ciência. E isso é importante... O nosso gerente geral, Christian Bertrand, gosta de falar que nós ainda estamos muito é, levados pela curiosidade. E eu não estou querendo é, fazer com que todos os cientistas na, no Pasteur se tornem homens de negócio. Essa não é a questão. E a segunda missão, que é o que eu ouvi vindo de vocês, é uma coisa que é muito compartilhada. Nós temos a saúde pública, essa missão. Nós precisamos oferecer soluções aos pacientes. E é ali que essa indústria de parceria e de transferência de tecnologia é importante. Nós temos a mesma missão de saúde pública e nós organizamos o Pasteur, e é por isso também que eu estou aqui na Frio Cruz para reforçar essa missão de saúde pública. Nós temos um centro para compartilhamento de conhecimento. Eu fiquei muito interessada em todos os números de patentes na Índia e dos indianos em geral, e também a, essa, essa visão da P&D no mundo inteiro. Essa missão é educação. Isso foi dito por Pasteur. E nós estamos em desenvolvimento muitos programas, por exemplo, nós temos um programa pan-africano muito grande, parcerias como Fundação Gates, Welcome Trust, nós desenvolvemos cursos para treinar cientistas na África, para desenvolverem centros e transferência de tecnologia na África para que os cientistas fiquem ali na África. Estamos fazendo muita troca de educação com PHD, pós-doutorado e jovens cientistas no mundo inteiro, compartilhando conhecimento e tornando todos esses países mais especializados para que, no final, eles tragam o desenvolvimento da saúde pública globalmente. E a última missão que o Luiz Pasteur teve e foi um pouquinho esquecida pela, pelos gerentes da, novos nos os planos de estratégia, é a transferência de tecnologia. Na França, nós usamos a palavra valorização. Eu detesto essa palavra, porque valorizar a ciência, você tem várias maneiras de fazer isso. Você tem publicações, vocês têm é, conselhos científicos é, e várias outras fontes. A transferência de tecnologia é somente uma parte da valorização. Comparado com a Fiocruz, eu gostaria de mostrar esses números, porque o Instituto Pasteur não é uma organização sem fundos lucrativos, ela é privada, mas quando nós dizemos que ela não é, é lucrativa, nós dizemos que ela também não quer ter perdas, né? 
Então, 20% vem do Estado e os ministros franceses, o resto é a nossa própria renda. Então, precisamos descobrir maneiras de fomentar isso. E quando nós falamos, voltando da palestra interior, quando falamos de propriedade intelectual, transferência de tecnologia, inovação, nós precisamos nos certificar de que nós podemos diferenciar por que nós estamos fazendo isso. A propriedade intelectual e patente para proteger a transferência de tecnologia para oferecer diagnósticos de drogas para pacientes e serviços, inovação para desenvolver tudo isso e também investimento. Isso é diferente. A transferência de tecnologia... Pode ser uma, uma organização é, lucrativa e nós temos muita é, transferência de tecnologia no mundo inteiro, que são empresas com fundos lucrativos. Temos muitas é, empresas de tecnologia americanas e do Reino Unido de transferência de tecnologia, onde eles têm um modelo que traz dinheiro para pesquisas através de transferência de tecnologia. E no Pasté é um pouco esquizofrênico, porque o meu departamento não tem fins lucrativos. O dinheiro volta para o pesquisador. Então, é parte deste investimento, onde nós recebemos essas ajudas e onde, por exemplo, 88 milhões vêm da indústria, dinheiro da indústria e de parcerias. E eu realmente gostaria de destacar esse fato, porque quando nós falamos sobre inovação, nós falamos sobre investimento em pesquisas. Quando nós falamos de transferência de tecnologia e parceria industrial, nós temos que saber onde esse dinheiro está indo e de onde ele está vindo. Nós temos muitos, muitas coisas que vêm da Comissão Europeia, como a EMAI, que é uma iniciativa de médica muito é, inovadora, mas parte vem do governo e parte vem de uma indústria. Então, isso é muito importante quando nós queremos saber que modelo precisamos ter no Instituto para trazer inovação e também para trazer soluções para pessoas na saúde. Eu estou falando somente sobre a saúde, nesse caso, é claro. De volta a essa missão do Instituto Pasteur, ele é muito grande. Nós temos 10 prêmios Nobel, é, ele fica com, tem 250 mil pessoas, aliás, 2.500 pessoas no campus, de 60 nacionalidades, muitos estudantes e um grande campus com muitos departamentos científicos e unidades de pesquisa que se focam em biologia, oncologia e outras áreas. Mas vocês todos sabem disso. O que é interessante é que existe uma nova organização com quatro grupos que são transversais e eu não sei quantos de vocês ainda trabalham no laboratório, mas quando eu comecei no Pasteur, alguns anos atrás, terminando meu PHD, esse aglomerado significava plataforma, ferramentas para pesquisar. E nessa época, no Pasteur, não era um segredo, era uma coisa que não era muito bem considerada. Eles não eram cientistas. As pessoas que eram especialistas em uma espectromia ou ressonância magnética eram mais técnicos e não cientistas. E, na realidade, agora, muito dinheiro da inovação vai a essa parte de tecnologia tecnologia, porque a tecnologia também está motivando a inovação. E nós temos essa organização dividida em quatro aglomerados que passam por todos os setores do Instituto Pasteur. Temos um centro de ciência 
translacional, nós temos a bioiniciativa, nós temos a parte clínica e médica e estamos trabalhando em parcerias com hospitais, com todos os parceiros para desenvolver é, ensaios clínicos, para trazermos respostas de algumas inovações que nós vemos dos nossos parceiros. Nós temos centros muito importantes para inovação e pesquisa tecnológica. Isso está crescendo, essa plataforma do Instituto Pastel está, Pastel está também fazendo parte disso, mas também temos o desenvolvimento de tecnologia para que nós possamos ser hóspedes de uma tecnologia industrial bem no início, não quando ela já está no mercado. Nós temos cientistas que desenvolvem essas aplicações, esse software, ou então para criar um startup nesse laboratório de tecnologia que é muito específico. Nós temos um centro de saúde global e ele está expandindo. Está expandindo porque nós temos uma parceria de desenvolvimento com vários atores da saúde global e é uma coisa muito complicada. Ano passado, meu departamento se juntou à WIPO, é, também à OMP, e ela ainda não era parte disso, mas se tornou com uma parte, e isso deve ser incluído, essa parte de propriedade intelectual. Talvez vocês não fiquem felizes de eu dizer isso, mas talvez não houvesse, não haja patente daqui a 10 anos. Então, é uma coisa muito importante. E a última, mas não a menos importante, é a bioinformática. Nós falamos muito sobre a inovação aberta que também é dados abertos. Quando nós falamos sobre a saúde global, Fiocruz, eu acho que é um dos maiores exemplos onde existe, um, quando tem uma epidemia, quando tem uma doença, vocês têm amostras de pacientes. E muitas pessoas consideram isso uma mina de ouro. A indústria quer isso. As pessoas querem usar isso para conseguir é, financiamento. Mas nós temos que levar em consideração toda essa inovação aberta. No final, nós queremos ter muito dinheiro vindo de amostras e dados ou nós queremos trazer produtos para, o, para a saúde? E essa é uma questão importante, não é fácil de se responder, e tem muitas, muitos modelos, mas é algo que nós temos, ao qual nós temos que nos adaptar rapidamente. Eu já falei anteriormente sobre educação. Nós sabemos que temos 32 institutos Pasteur no mundo, e nós temos uma parceria longa com a Fiocruz, que é um dos nossos parceiros. E agora nós estamos desenvolvendo, usando esses aglomerados trans transversais e a inovação também vindo dos cientistas da Pasteur. Nós estamos desenvolvendo programas através dessa rede. É assim que funciona. Nós desenvolvemos programas através desses aglomerados e eles vão por todos os departamentos de Paris e todos os institutos Pasteur da rede. E eu gostaria de dizer também que nós fazemos parte dessa rede. Nós não temos 33, nós agora temos 34. Isso é muito importante porque se você estiver sozinho, mesmo que você seja brilhante, você não vai conseguir oferecer produtos e a ajudar a saúde, tanto quanto se você fizesse isso em uma equipe. E se você falar sobre propriedade intelectual, eu gostaria de dizer que 100% de zero não é muito. Então, você pode ter muitas patentes e ter é, aqueles contratos de licenciamento onde você consegue tudo e no final não tem nenhum produto, você gasta muito dinheiro para conseguir uma patente por nada e uma boa publicação para o cientista é melhor 
é uma inovação melhor, uma pro, me, melhor prova de inovação do que a patente que não consegue nada no final. Então, é por isso que essa colaboração é muito importante. Esse é o nosso modelo no Pasteur. Quando um cientista está interessado em partir para alguma coisa e fazer a transferência, nós analisamos o desenvolvimento de novos remédios e produtos e trazer novas tecnologias à indústria e também encorajamos empreendedorismo para desenvolvimento econômico no mundo. Então, é isso que nós decidimos no meu departamento do Instituto Pasteur como um escritório de tecnologia, de transferência de tecnologia. Como nós fazemos? Em quatro processos. É a parte da proteção, quer dizer, patentes. E nós estamos tentando trazer mais inovação. Anteriormente, falamos que temos várias, podemos ter muitas patentes que não são fortes ou podemos passar pelo processo de patente, gastar muito dinheiro. E isso depende muito do que o Instituto quer fazer. Existe um grande instituto na França e não é nenhum segredo, é o, é o CIEID, e para eles ter várias patentes atrai parcerias industriais. Então, eles fazem muitas patentes. Eu não tento forçar trazer mais patentes. O que nós fazemos é tentar trazer mais inovação. Então, o que foi implementado ano passado no Pasteur tem um interesse. Eles têm dinheiro, os empreendedores, se eles verem os objetivos no Pasteur, nós temos objetivos e tem vários indicadores de performance, temos a visibilidade do Pasteur, o número de é, subvenções internacionais e o número de inovação foi o número de, in, de é, inovações que foram, é, e não o número de patentes. Isso é para promover, para que o cientista entenda que trazer uma patente à tona é importante para o cientista, para o instituto, para o go governo e para a saúde global. E realmente ter essa revelação da invenção é um indicador de performance de inovação. Depois disso, o que nós temos é uma equipe sólida para fazer desenvolvimento de negócios. Eu não gosto dessa palavra porque você tem o termo negócios, mas não necessariamente significa dinheiro. É uma equipe que entenda a indústria, as necessidades e também o potencial de passar de patente para um produto, porque você pode ter uma patente muito forte, mas não há necessidade para o paciente ou para a indústria. Nós precisamos saber disso para podermos entrar ou passar para a fase do processo. E nós temos, então, o que nós chamamos de todos esses links acadêmicos com a indústria ou ISL, que a maior parte das vezes entram no contrato. Gestão de contrato. Quando você manda uma amostra, você tem que fazer um acordo de uh, transferência. E ao querer colaborar com um parceiro da indústria, você faz um contrato de colaboração em pesquisa. Quando você encontra uma forma de explorar sua patente, você faz um contrato de licenciamento. Então, tudo isso é gestão de contrato. E uma vez feito, uma coisa importante é a exploração. Eu venho da indústria e eu passei quase 30 anos na indústria de tecnologia. Eu trabalhei uh, na General Electric desenvolvendo tecnologia. Então, em P&D, nós temos o que os cientistas está, estavam usando cinco ou seis anos atrás ao desenvolver o espectrômetro de massa para biólogos, quando só era usado para físicos e químicos, quando desenvolvemos o sequenciamento. Ou seja, eu conheço os truques da indústria e sempre é melhor quando você 
está liderando o Departamento de Tecnologia Acadêmica, Transferência de Tecnologia Acadêmica. Essa exploração, você precisa saber o que o seu parceiro faz para saber se não está faltando uma pequena colaboração para seguir adiante e para continuar avançando num teste de toxicologia ou para ajudá-los a ter mais informação para encontrar o que deve encontrar. Ou seja, você precisa continuar essa colaboração. E também precisa saber que talvez esteja satisfeito e talvez tenha muito dinheiro vindo de um contrato, mas o parceiro na indústria talvez não esteja ganhando nada. Então, para o cientista e para o mundo, está perdido, porque você não tem nada. Essa fase, então, de exploração é muito importante. E para ilustrar, esse é um slide antigo, mas a transferência de tecnologia não é igual em tudo que é lugar. Você pode fazer muito através de colaboração em P&D e pode-se fazer muito através de licenciamento. E isso está ligado à a, a questão de se a organização é com fins lucrativos ou não. Desculpe aqui, as cores não são as melhores para vocês conseguirem ler daí, mas aqui em azul temos a licença. Podem ver por exemplo, que Harvard tem muito que vem do dinheiro da indústria, enquanto a NYU, eles vêm, na verdade, de licenciamento próprio e de se esforçarem muito em colocar foco em patente e licenciamento externo. É complicado vender uma patente, enquanto que o MIT é meio misturado e o Pasteur também é meio misturado. Nós temos o privilégio no Pasteur de também ter uma marca vocês estavam falando sobre branding, a marca do Pasteur é trazer recursos como licenciamento para o Instituto. Isso, então, reflete o que significa valorização e inovação. E eu quero aqui é, falar de que as nossas atividades realmente se focam em passar dos resultados de pesquisa que podem ser publicação, processo, tecnologia, materiais também, habilidades, dados, software, passar para o mundo econômico. E é aí que nós temos diversas ferramentas, patentes são uma das ferramentas, mas há diversas outras em que nós precisamos passar para esse outro lado e garantir que haja recursos para a pesquisa e dessa forma que nós tenhamos recursos para voltar para a pesquisa. Todos vocês sabem, essa relação academia-indústria é muito complicada. Então, um dos focos do meu departamento é sim, ok, é patente, sim, ok, é licenciamento, mas é uma colaboração com a indústria. Nos meus trabalhos anteriores, e eu não sou especialista em patentes, eu sou especialista em alianças e parcerias estratégicas, e isso é muito importante, porque muitos contratos e acordos fracassam, porque as pessoas não falam o mesmo idioma, nós não temos os mesmos interesses, e nós precisamos saber disso. Eu sei que em todos os nossos departamentos, e eu tenho certeza de que aqui acontece a mesma coisa, de que nós sempre nos deparamos com brigas com as pessoas do jurídico, e tem o pessoal do jurídico, e o pessoal do comercial, e os cientistas não entendem também por que você passa seis meses para saber se como é que vai ser a lei uh, no Uruguai ou no Brasil, e os cientistas ficam muito irritados, e nós temos que nos esforçar para garantir que nós falemos a mesma língua. Há muitas oportunidades, há muitos desafios também entre a academia e a indústria. As necessidades são diferentes, o risco não é o mesmo, e às vezes eles acham que assumem um grande risco por nós na academia e não é nada, e vice-versa. Há algum risco para nós, risco uh, em relação à ética, regulamentação, para os nossos doadores também, se há pessoas que doam para os programas, que não necessariamente são os mesmos riscos industriais. Nós temos também uma cultura diferente. Então, ao fazer parcerias, e isso é muito importante, 
na transferência de tecnologia, ao desenvolvê-la no Pasteur, nós precisamos saber aceitar e abordar diferentes aspectos. Que os objetivos são colaborar, mas os objetivos estratégicos devem ser os mesmos. Entretanto, dentro do contrato, pode ser diferente. Por exemplo, alcançar a clínica versus garantir a ou proteger a propriedade intelectual, publicar. A estrutura financeira também deve apoiar o objetivo, e é por isso que no Pasteur muitos cientistas ficam surpresos, porque eu quero que a minha equipe esteja presente quando eles começarem a falar com o parceiro industrial. Eles dizem, mas Isabel, nós vamos falar sobre ciência, nós não precisamos de você, que é do administrativo, mas nós precisamos estar lá para entender as necessidades, e as necessidades não são as mesmas. Eu preciso entender a necessidade do meu cientista, a necessidade do Pasteur, do Instituto Pasteur, e da nossa rede internacional. Eu preciso escutar quais são as verdadeiras necessidades da indústria. E ao fazer isso antecipadamente, você pode estabelecer um contrato de forma rápida e você tem aí uma situação potencialmente ganha-ganha. E é claro que as regras, as normas relacionadas aos conceitos-chave devem ser pré-acordadas. Isso é algo que já de início nós estabelecemos, não no final do contrato, depois de um ano de conversas, e sim já de início. Na transferência de tecnologia, nós temos a patente, temos o licenciamento e temos o desenvolvimento de negócios e a transferência de tecnologia, onde o desenvolvimento do, tec do, do negócio precisa existir, assim como a gestão de alianças e a gestão de contrato. E esse é um negócio diferente, mas tudo isso faz parte de, de trazer a transferência de tecnologia para o mundo. Alguns números aqui. No ano passado, nós estávamos tentando ou forçando uh, para a abertura das invenções. E uh, vocês sabem que o Pasteur é muito forte em patentes. Houve uma publicação na Nature Biotechnology no verão passado, onde ficamos entre os dez primeiros, porque nós precisamos demorar mais tempo como cientistas para fazer mais experimentos, mas para ter uma patente muito forte. É uma escolha institucional. Eu estava falando com o Imperial College de Oxford, onde eles, onde eles estão tentando ter muitas patentes. Quase todas as revelações de invenções se tornam patentes. E essa é uma estratégia da gestão geral do Instituto. Nós temos em torno de 2 mil patentes em 300 famílias e todos os anos nós fazemos mais ou menos de 100 a 200 contratos na equipe e com mais e mais acordos de transferência material. Isso é muito importante. Eu sei que vocês têm isso e vocês têm nos Estados Unidos, por exemplo, eles colocam um foco muito forte em propriedade intelectual e em exploração. Às vezes, os cientistas não entendem porque eles querem trabalhar com o um colaborador, mas aí a universidade vem e apresenta e apresenta algo que tem um impacto muito importante. Uh, precisamos ter cuidado. Nós criamos ao todo 24 acordos. É aqui é a organização, não vou insistir, mas nós estamos aqui implementando um bilingualismo entre a academia e a indústria, por assim dizer. Nós temos uma equipe com experiência técnica e de negócios 
muitas pessoas trabalharam com P&D na indústria, por exemplo, mas todos têm PHD e foram cientistas anteriormente. Isso é transferência de tecnologia e a parcerias, patentes. Aqui é o fluxo de trabalho para passagem para o mundo industrial e aqui a gestão de licenças, que é muito importante. E o modelo é que com todos os departamentos, é por isso que na Fiocruz nós temos o privilégio de tivemos o privilégio de ter o presidente da Fiocruz conversando conosco, onde estavam presentes os CEOs do mundo, e nós precisamos saber o que é que os cientistas têm. Isso não é fácil. O modelo que nós temos é trabalhar com uma rede, trabalhar com gabinetes, e nós tentamos mapear o que nós temos cientificamente falando e identificar onde é que nós podemos, então, passar para a fase de transferência de tecnologia. Mas lembrem-se de que nem toda a ciência passa por esse processo. Eu estou falando apenas sobre transferência de tecnologia. Então, aqui, o gabinete de concessão se concentra no financiamento que vem de doações nacionais e internacionais mas nós também temos as concessões financeiras no Pasteur para passar a transferência de tecnologia para esse lado aqui. Então, o que nós fazemos, temos um projeto científico em que nós precisamos de uma prova de conceito ou, ou seja, um estudo em um pequeno número de pessoas, nós, então, oferecemos os recursos financeiros à ciência para que produza algo mais sólido e qualificado para a indústria. Por um lado, então, nós temos a estratégia científica e o portfólio de projetos. A estratégia científica é muito importante, porque para nós, quando passamos para esse lado, nós precisamos saber o que é que a instituição vai ganhar. Nós estamos agora passando para a parte de biologia, por exemplo. E isso é algo que nós precisamos saber para aumentar o número de parceiros potenciais. E, por outro lado, nós dialogamos muito com a indústria, não a parte de P&D, porque os cientistas os conhecem. Nós também conversamos com as pessoas responsáveis pelas unidades de negócios ou clínicas. Novamente, a palestrante anterior mencionou muitas coisas interessantes. Falamos sobre inovação da Johnson Johnson, por exemplo. Todos os recursos financeiros que a indústria deu para a ciência foi um fracasso. Não houve retorno sobre o investimento. Então, o que eles fizeram foi tentar fazer centros ou, ou contratar pessoas. para encontrar o que é a ciência. A Johnson Johnson Innovation abriu portas nos Estados Unidos, Ásia Pacífica, Europa, e a senhora que abriu Johnson Johnson Innovation na Ásia estava me dizendo que quase dois anos com a Universidade de Tóquio, em que a Johnson Johnson dizia, cientistas, o que, é que vocês têm? E os cientistas perguntavam para Johnson Johnson, o que, é que vocês querem? E eles ficavam dialogando dessa forma, o que, é que você tem, o que, é que você quer? E isso é muito importante, conversar em todos os níveis. Às vezes, por exemplo, a Novartis, as infecções, as, as doenças infecciosas da Novartis, as pessoas falam, ah, eu, as, as, eu as conheço muito bem. E dependendo de onde você esteja, você fala, ah, elas estão em Singapura ou nos Estados Unidos. Na verdade, essa, são a mesma localização. Existe uma diferença, que em Singapura eles trabalham na pesquisa e ela não está ligada ao portfólio de produtos. Na costa oeste dos Estados Unidos, eles trabalham em pesquisa, mas ligada ao portfólio de produtos. Então, se você tem, por exemplo um assunto científico que não seja um produto 
no portfólio da Novartis, não vá lá fazer a viagem para a Costa Oeste, porque eles não vão investir um centavo naquilo. Vá para Singapura. E é por isso que nós precisamos saber ou conhecer o nosso parceiro industrial para conhecer suas políticas e suas necessidades científicas e financeiras e identificar por que a Merck, de repente, na França, obteve uma doação incrível de um doador. Muito provavelmente porque existe um interesse, um interesse puramente político com o governo francês. Isso também é algo que vocês precisam saber. E se vocês trabalham só com ciência, não vão saber sobre essas necessidades. Se só trabalharem com relações industriais, não vão conhecer também a ciência. É por isso que nós nos reorganizamos assim, dessa forma, no Pasteur. Desculpe, eu sei que eu me atrasei bastante. Esse é um exemplo dessa colaboração internacional. Não é apenas um desenho de todos os institutos Pasteur no mundo. E nós vemos aqui que vocês estão aqui. Esse é um exemplo concreto onde, no momento, nós temos um estudo de caso que nós iniciamos no Uruguai, Dakar e Camboja. para construir uma plataforma global de genômica. Nós estamos trabalhando de forma científica, ética, para implementar o NGS e as plataformas tecnológicas utilizando os mesmos protocolos e padrões em diferentes locais do mundo. E em desenvolvimento, nós Dizemos aqueles locais onde uh, não há desenvolvimento de informática, nós precisamos, com, podemos ou não compartilhar informação e ter muito cuidado com relação à exploração de dados e garantir a proteção. Trabalhamos com diversos parceiros, como a Bill Gates e Sage, e pessoas também que fornecem as tecnologias para implementar esse tipo de atividade. Um programa que já teve início é o projeto humano global de saúde, onde nós desenvolvemos um estudo clínico com pessoas saudáveis, saudáveis pela definição brasileira e francesa, comem, bebem, mas não tem patologia, não são super saudáveis, só não estão doentes. E nós fazemos muito sequenciamento, imunofenotipificação uh, e experimentos no seroma, pele e a microbiota. E nós acreditamos que isso tem que ser compartilhado. E é isso que nós iniciamos, então, em diferentes lugares. E no mês que vem, há um grande desafio com a Gates Foundation, em que nós vamos ter um workshop, em que todos os grandes players, incluindo a indústria, o Google, o Verilab, General Electric, vão estar lá, e também instituições uh, da Gates, por exemplo, Sage, a OMS, para ver como é que nós podemos realmente desenvolver isso para o benefício do paciente e a, para a inovação da ciência, porque isso traz mais entendimento sobre a ciência. E eu diria aqui que a patente não é a coisa principal, a principal preocupação é o investimento. De onde que virá o recurso? Porque essa é a discussão. Onde que o recurso virá? De onde ele virá? E é o que isso que nós apresentamos estamos desenvolvendo e no desenvolvimento global internacional eu estava, eu trabalhava na GE eu conheço o, o, o novo chefe do, dos dados globais. Talvez vocês queiram compartilhar essa rede. Eu conheço muitas pessoas em outras empresas. Você também conhece pessoas que têm uma posição muito alta e têm um poder para levar as coisas adiante. É isso que nós precisamos compartilhar. E se nós fizermos isso, seremos mais fortes. Mas não quer dizer que nós não mantenhamos sigilo, confidencialidade, o que é do pastel 
pertence ao pastério, que da Fiocruz, pertence à Fiocruz, mas tem uma grande parte que nós podemos compartilhar. Isso tem a ver com o treinamento do pessoal, alinhar a expertise, combinar tecnologias e ofertas científicas, desenvolvendo oportunidades, compartilhar ferramentas. Tem pessoas aqui na Fiocruz que estavam trabalhando no Zika e, no final, a plataforma usada para essa tecnologia foi feita por um parceiro industrial. E vocês têm outros parceiros industriais que gastaram 10 milhões de dólares nos últimos 10 anos para desenvolver essa tecnologia para conseguir um diagnóstico. O que nós estamos discutindo agora e também o motivo de eu estar aqui é por que, que nós não oferecemos essa tecnologia de graça dos fabricantes. Eles treinam o nosso pessoal e aí quando nós ou vocês ou alguém da rede desenvolver uma coisa que possa ser desenvolvida rápida, implementada rápida, e nós manteremos o controle na ciência. Mas a parceria industrial não é somente uma questão de recursos, de dinheiro, mas sim o que vocês conhecem como treinamento de, que vai desde o chefe de é, relacionamentos médicos a todas as pessoas. E para nós, isso é dinheiro, porque senão nós pagaríamos por isso. Mas esse, esse compartilhamento de tecnologias e expertise e, é muito importante. Eu falei sobre investimentos inicialmente, rapidamente. E no final, aqui no Pasteur, nós temos somente 24% que vem do Estado. Nós não sabemos se amanhã nós teremos dinheiro vindo do Estado. Nós precisamos seguir o seguinte na pesquisa. Nós estamos falando aqui sobre uma empresa é, lucrativa, sobre ganhar muito dinheiro, e no momento o investimento está vindo somente em três aspectos. Do base, do, do, da pesquisa aplicada com uma colaboração que está aumentando, com muito investimento do governo, onde frequentemente a indústria faz parte disso, para aumentar a colaboração e também para aumentar a inovação aberta. A outra parte também, onde você consegue encontrar recursos, é desenvolvimento de tecnologia, e isso é algo que nós usamos em ciência. E a terceira parte é ensaios clínicos. E se você ver no geral, o que o governo, a indústria, onde eles usam os seus recursos, fica ali. É claro que é uma visão simplista, mas é importante que nós mapeamos essa ciência por trás disso. Então, o que eu estava dizendo é que na transferência de tecnologia, nós precisamos ter os recursos do PID investidos de maneira apropriada mas nós também precisamos de dinheiro para fazer o PID. Mas o, quando o PID estiver pronto, nós não precisamos reembolso sistemático, mas precisamos continuar com o PID. Então, o que nós fizemos, porque é claro, nós falamos muito sobre propriedade intelectual, é essencial em toda essa discussão, nós temos temos, é, no, tivemos no Pasteur ano passado um workshop organizado que falou sobre licenciamento de IPI em geral, porque lembre-se do que eu falei, tudo está conectado. Se mudarmos uma coisa, nós precisamos repensar tudo. E no momento em que a patente vem de várias regulamentações e decisões que são feitas nos, nos anos passados, num contexto diferente, isso é algo que nós, que as pessoas, estão abordando muito bem. E eu gostaria de mostrar rapidamente para vocês o que nós fizemos. A ideia era realmente nos concentrarmos nos benefícios da saúde, entender o papel da, das políticas de licenciamento, porque se você tem uma patente, você tem que licenciar, você pode mudar a patente ou a maneira com a qual você usa esse licenciamento, 
o papel da propriedade intelectual, da transferência de tecnologia e lançar um projeto de pesquisa que trabalhe com a patente e, e políticas de licenciamento num nível de governo. Então, praticamente, eu não vou falar sobre tudo isso, mas existem nove pontos que devem ser considerados. E eu descrevi anteriormente, e a palestrante anterior também descreveu isso, que é saber que as universidades, institutos, são eles que gerenciam a estratégia. Eles precisam se reservar o direito de praticar invenções licenciadas. Licenças exclusivas precisam ser estruturadas. Isso é uma coisa muito importante e diferente no mundo inteiro. Nós temos que cuidar também do que nós chamamos de melhorias futuras, a maneira como você coloca essa licença, porque é um impacto. E pontos diferentes que mostram que você tem regras de patente, mas também tem regras de licenciamento que são extremamente importantes e podem trazer e, e fazer com que o objetivo do cientista, da instituição e do paciente sejam é, considerados ao mesmo tempo. Também tem muitos outros pontos que devem ser considerados, porque o ambiente social é extremamente importante. Todos esses pontos vocês também encontrarão na OMP e na conferência em si. Eu não sou a melhor pessoa para apresentar isso, mas eu quero te dar duas abordagens práticas. A Yale, eles desenvolveram um modelo de licenciamento de acesso igualitário. E isso foi uma, uma parceria inovadora em todos os licenciamentos. Você não vai saber o que aconteceu na ciência. Você pode ter uma patente e fez um licenciamento para a oncologia, porque você estava fazendo um licenciamento, não sei, com a Pfizer. E no dia seguinte, existe uma, teve uma grande implicação na saúde global, um problema. E aí você fica preso. Então, desculpe pela maneira como eu falo, mas você fica preso com esse contrato. Então, isso é importante. E esse foi o exemplo da IEL. Na Pasteur, de fato, o que nós fazemos é, nós tivemos um exemplo de diagnóstico de tuberculose e nós ajustamos para garantir que ele não seja é, bloqueado, não atrase o licenciamento, nós adaptamos isso para países intermediários, e é claro que os países de renda mais baixa, mas o que é importante é que ele pode chegar a vários países. Então, o que nós também estamos discutindo agora nesse momento são diagnósticos é, que, baseados em membrana, temos essa taxa ajustável de acordo com o consumidor final. Nós queremos nos certificar de que possamos é, cumprir a nossa missão. Me desculpe por ter tomado muito tempo. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Elizabeth Eater. Mais uma coisa antes de eu sair. Em setembro, não sei se vocês já leram, mas tem um relatório muito interessante que fala sobre inovação e acesso à tecnologia de saúde no contexto social. Eu acho que é um resumo muito bom sobre o que vocês já sabem e já foi apresentado. Good morning, everyone. Before I start my lecture, I would like Celeste, I wish Celeste was here with me because I would really like to let you know that being part of an event such as this one, there is no way uh, we cannot be touched by that. Especially 
celebrating 30 years of GSTEC. This is the moment for us to recognize how important is the work that GSTEC has been carrying out in terms of uh, intellectual property and the technology transfer in the country. Uh, since I got to know Gestec with Celeste's management, I would like to pay homage to Celeste, even though now I met uh, Marilia, that I know that she studied everything this field here in at Fiocruz. So Celeste, thank you very much. I'm glad you're here in the room. I would like to pay great homage to you and thank you very much, and I'm going to dare doing that on behalf of Brazil, on behalf of the country, because uh, if we had this advancement in terms of uh, innovation management at ICTs, we owe a lot of that to Celeste's work. I know we can't do anything in this life alone. She's always had a team backing her up that as competent as her to support her in all these actions. But Celeste, for us managers at technology transfer managers at ICTs, she's a, an example. Uh, and I, I, make, I make a joke with her. I say she's the mother of everyone because she's the one that caused everything to happen, at, not only at just tech, but also at repeat and she brought all that to Fortec. So allow me to pay this homage before I start my lecture. Well, now I'm going to present to you. We heard about the international context and the wonderful experience of Institute, uh, Pasteur Institute. Now let's hear a little bit about our country and the advancements we've been having in the last few years. So this is a brief summary. I'm trying to speak a little faster because I know we press for time. Uh, whenever Whenever we mention international context, we like to position ourselves and what is happening globally in terms of what we're doing here. So I think it's important for us to bring up some points, also to justify why this movement has been taking place in the last years. And the initial point that I would like to bring up is that we noticed more involvement of ICTs in innovation, and that has been bringing us new ways of transferring knowledge. So what used to be known, what used to be public domain, it's not enough anymore to generate uh, economical social benefits. On the other hand, the research financed by uh, public resources is still considered to be important for and uh, core of the scientific uh, advancement, supporting social needs and supporting innovation. But we can't stop considering it. Uh, we have to consider it independent from the the, the commercial uh, commercial ends. So there's more awareness of the of the studies about the value of intellectual property. And we also would like to talk about the new legislations and rules to regulate and explore intellectual property. That's what's been happening in most countries, trying to add more value to the intellectual uh, property patrimonium. Uh, we Research is automatically uh, translated into use in an era in which policies are continuously reinvented in order to reach a goal. In other words, to make everything that uh, brings benefit to the public into science. So even though we know that legislation is not everything and I have a few problems with my uh, uh, doctors, um, 
advisor, it's not everything, of course. Uh, if it doesn't come with governmental programs and articulation in all of the uh, parts of the chain, it, it's, it's worthless. But there's something we cannot deny. In all countries where they had legislation that would uh, regulate technological innovations, they had advancements. And now I'd like to mention Bidal Act, because whenever we talk about ICT innovation management, uh, because it is considered the, uh, the, the magnet letter of the transfer in, transfers of knowledge academically, because it was the basis of everything that was built throughout the world in terms of academic technology, technology transfer, and that inspired several countries. Germany, France, United Kingdom, Spain, Korea, China, Japan, Canada, just mentioning a few, and Brazil was also inspired by Baidu. And I'd like to remind, remind a lot of you, we brought the former Senator Roberto Freire to talk about his first law that was about it, that innovation, technological innovation in Brazil. And when he searched for this inspiration, he went to Beidou. And since he had communist uh, uh, beliefs back then, he couldn't explain how to get inspired in an American piece of legislation to propose something to Brazil. That's why he based on the French law. But the French law has a lot to do with Beidou. But I think that's why we are aligned with the same principles. What main impacts did this legislation bring to the whole world? The first one, of course, is to uh, bring a unique re regulation of uh, invention property that is financed with governmental resources and also in terms of uh, commercial uh, Again, that brought great, is, is, uh, fostered a lot the interaction between companies and university. So it, the universities as a knowledge generator are the basis of where companies will look for this advanced knowledge. And it also brought more uniform procedures. Uh, the more institutionalized the management of uh, technology transfer is, the more uniform the procedures must be when they are applied. Sharing uh, financial gains, which is another issue that was only possible after specific legislation. Uh, fostering regional and economical development was one of the vital objectives, and that's something we can see in all of the pieces of legislation uh, through the creation of uh, companies and, and, and um, more jobs and development of new companies that are considered spin-offs, startups, companies. And another aspect that results from all that was the creation of technology transfer offices, which are interaction mechanisms between the knowledge sector and the production products and processes sector. And that only reinforces the need that was mentioned before of the internal expertise that should be appropriate to the management of intellectual property. This is the international context. Now let's talk about Brazil and about how everything got started here. The first NIT's experience was uh, with the Science and Technology Ministry, CNPQ. It wasn't even the ministry yet. It didn't exist yet. It was created that year. And then they had a program of uh, technological information. We, they selected about 13 universities in Brazil. And then they started to talk about not only technological information, but uh, the foundations of the concern of technology transfer. Some of them uh, came through, others didn't. They, they weren't, they didn't continue. Uh, Possibly because the country wasn't mature enough for this theme back then. But then, right after that, in 86, 
they created JSTAC and Fia Cruz was one of the pioneers in the whole process. Later on, US became the University of Sao Paulo with their invention uh, group and then Unicamp in 91 with the first technology transfer office that became a JSTAG and more recently it became uh, Innova agency that's so successful and so known. Universidade Federal de Janeiro, uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, that start, started with COP, which is one of the NITs from the year, the previous year, and then it was extended throughout the whole university. Just to mention a few. And I'd like to mention something that when we analyze history, we forget because there was a uh, done later through legislations, it was a decree from 1998 that regulated Article 75 and 88 to 93 of the industrial property law. And for the first time, they talked about uh, financial gain sharing with researchers. At that occasion, they were concerned about sharing the financial gains with uh, funny, uh, technology transfer with inventors. And then later with the innovation law that was contemplated and uh, there was a decree and it was uh, applied more vigorously. And then when we talk about management of intellectual property and uh, technology transfer in the Brazilian context, there is no way we can forget about the disseminating role of uh, repict. And um, there's so many people that have been involved in this process. Repict was uh, uh, served as reference in this country, whether because it fostered the participation of ICTs to discuss the thing. I remember that in the beginning, uh, there were a lot of uncertainties, and then it increased little by little, and then he picked was really successful, not only in terms of audience, but also how uh, in the quality of the discussions they brought. Also, it's a good moment to practice good management practices. Uh, and we cannot forget that was at repeat that we discussed innovation law. Uh, we They really something that uh, brought a lot of stamina to everything that we saw being developed later. And we cannot forget that Repict was the inception of Fortech. We wanted to create that a, a national entity. We couldn't do that because of restrictions, because it was a regional entity. But it certainly was the inception of Fortech, which is now an association that gathers uh, ICT's innovation managers. And now they have more than 300 affiliated. Uh, so, in terms of innovation law, most of you know the impacts of the law, but I just wanted to to highlight a few important points of the innovation law. One of them is the recognition of the role of the ICTs in innovation, and I thought that that was the most important point because uh, there was a lot of discussion about the role of the ICTs in the innovation process, and of course, this law brought this very clearly. Uh, more institutionalization of the interaction between company, government, and universities until that moment working with companies wasn't something very uh, well received. Uh, well, we, this law said that not only it was possible, but it was one of their duties to interact with companies. And that certainly brought a new uh, dynamics for the introduction of uh, ICT's policies. So it became part of the agenda. Another important point of the law is the recognition of the importance of protecting intellectual property. Introduction of the concept of business in the academia, uh, even though our colleagues don't like business because it has to do with money, but when money refeeds the process and brings public benefits, it has its role. 
That's why within the academia context, talking about business, which was something that was uh, almost forbidden in the beginning, it became part of it because we see how that can become a useful tool for society. Another important thing about the law, we talked both during Beatrice's presentation and Isabel's, is the indicators. Brazil didn't have enough indicators in this area. With the innovation law, for mixed uh, made it mandatory for the ICTs to present reports every year brought a lot of uh, statistic data that allows us to carry out studies and have uh, organ uh, organizational policies. That was a very important product that came out of the law as well. And of course, bringing to our context the emergency of needs, Article 16, to, uh, to, to start the transfer of technology. It's something that was basic, solid, and it brought substance to the development of our actions within the ICTs. Introducing these new policies and introducing all of this work also brought about some impact on the ICTs, establishing policies, whereas before the ICTs did not have any specific policies for that, and the policies became uh, central to the implementation of the NIDS because uh, the law states that we have uh, to care for the maintenance of uh, intellectual property in technology transfer. That's why most of the ICTs in Brazil have their institutional policies. New management mechanisms, the NIT itself is one of them. Defining flows and procedures, uh, we saw that one of the important aspects of intellectual laws is standardizing procedures, and it's also a central thing here, too. The use of legal instruments to formalize relationships. Isabel spoke about the agreements for the transfer of biomaterials. That was a legal instrument that was very underutilized in the previous part, whereas today it's frequent in our ICTs. Confidentiality agreements, research contracts, everything became duly formalized. And another aspect, greater speed in uh, the internal processing of documents. Of course, there are still a few critical aspects here, but generally speaking, that was another impact brought about by the innovation law. In spite of advancements, we still had a few problems, which were legal insecurity when applying the law, bringing about conflicts between legislations, between innovation laws and labor laws and fiscal laws, just to mention a few. There was also a lack of coordination between all the links in the innovation chain and other types of barriers. So all that contributed for the innovation law to not have the expected impacts. And that's why that led us to a need for revising it with a new innovation uh, framework that was signed in January this year. However, to really implement the benefits and the impacts that were expected with the legal framework, a change to the Constitution was needed. Before the Constitution, uh, in, at the end of 2015, an amendment was signed, and I won't go into detail because uh, we uh, have time constraints, but just to give an idea, all of this was part of this amendment, but the most important aspect is that it introduced innovation as a goal of the state, whereas that was not previously set forth in our legislation. After that, all these other items are actually results of the main result, of main goal, which is introducing innovation as a state, a goal of the state. The law itself in a nutshell, deals with a stimuli for scientific development, research, scientific training, and innovation. So technology and innovation were 
inserted by the amended it, amendment. It also extends the purpose of the law of 2004 with measures for training, technological training and development of the national and regional production system of the country. Among other aspects, it also extends the list of definitions, including the technological bonus, uh, which I'll speak about shortly, and it also defines the parks and incubators, changes the definition of creators who also become natural persons, expands the concept of ICTs because in the uh, 2004, it only considered public institutions as ICTs, whereas now they already added uh, the private and not for profit institutions and changes the concepts of nets. These are some highlights of the new legislation. It intends to consolidate innovating environments, enabling public ICTs to be able to grant the use of real estate for the installation and consolidating consolidation of innovating innovation promoting environment and that's quite something that's something quite new it also provides for the minority participation of the union uh, in the social capital of companies with the purpose of developing innovative products or processes. Another important aspect that uh, was uh, related to legal insecurity uh, is about simplifying procedures to, prov to, prov uh, to render accounts of public services provided by fostering agencies, transposition or reallocation or transfer of resources uh, from the resources of one category to another is now much simpler. Another aspect related to intellectual property and other advancement was that in the previous legislation, the ICTs were not allowed to grant intellectual property in its negotiations with companies, whereas now, it provides for that possibility as long as express uh, authorization is given. The receiver of the rights should also adequately compensate the ICTs. In the case of the Formict, since the concept of the ICT was one of a public institution, the Formics would only require the public institutions to present the reports, but now the private institutions are also required to do that in practical terms. That was already happening, but this is a formalization of the process. Economic subsidies to companies were also increased, as well as the waiver of a bidding process for R&D activities that involve the technological risk. Another benefit was the internationalization of ICTs. Public ICTs can carry out activities related to science, technology, and innovation outside of Brazil. One important aspect that has directly to do with our activities at the NITS are new guidelines for ICTs and NITs themselves when it comes to a few aspects, such as, for instance, the commitment to transfer knowledge. The NIT manager had no mechanism before to engage the researcher in the technology transfer processes. I mean, we have the patents and the NITs, and if we do not have researchers committed to transferring knowledge that was something a, uh, that was really a hindrance if we wanted to work with technology transfer in the broader sense. But as the legislation establishes the commitment to transfer knowledge, that makes the work of the NIT manager 
much more solid and supported. Another aspect is for full-time professors to be allowed to carry out R&D activities in companies as well. That was also provided for by the previous legislation, but gained new support. Support to the career uh, does not interrupt the career of the professor. Uh, when they want to stop their career as professors, the, they can interrupt their career for up to three years, and when they're back, they still have the same benefits and advantages as if they had continued uh, carrying on with their activities. Full-time professors can also dedicate 416 annual hours f to support innovation in companies. And this activity, I'd like to highlight that there was all also a decree from 1987 that provided for this limit of eight weekly hours to provide s consulting services and there was almost a retrocession here because in the discussion of this new legal framework, they wanted to decrease the number of hours. And finally, they were able to maintain what we already had and to maintain the international standard, which is of eight weekly hours. Exclusive licenses and joint development with companies. These R&D projects that are developed with companies was also made easier due to the fact that in those cases, the ICT, even the public ones, can grant the owner's rights to companies. There's also a cessation of the requirement to uh, publish that in the official newspaper of Brazil. And another aspect is uh, new competencies for the NIT, in addition to those already established in the 2004 law. Now, we also have the competency to develop studies of technological prospection and competitive intelligence. And uh, the most important aspect, from my perspective, is that it provides for the possibility of there being a change in the legal profile of the NIT. The NIT could be comprised uh, with its own legal personality as a private entity that's not for, for profit, which will bring about certainly more empowerment and more speed and uh, re construction of a private-private interface, which will expedite the processes. It also provides for the delegation of competencies and that the NIT manager can become responsible for the institution. Undoubtedly, that's a very significant advancement. The participation of ICTs in startup companies, the technological bonus that I mentioned at the beginning, is also a strong instrument to provide stimulus to the small and mid-sized companies in that they can use this technological bonus for the sharing and utilization of research infrastructure and uh, hiring specialized technological services or technology transfer that will expedite the processes and give significant support to small and mid-sized companies. Some quick words about Develop about performance indicators. This morning we heard several examples, but I just wanted to mention a few initiatives that are being developed in an attempt to try to move the focus away from quantitative indicators and more towards qualitative indicators. Generally speaking, indicators focus too much on numbers, number of inventions, number of patents, number of royalties, number of interactions, whereas actually what we see is that these indicators are based on the practices of developed countries. They do not consider the diversity of ways uh, in which uh, this occurs in different countries. And that's a way through which we're trying to participate in the discussion in terms of trying to consider more qualitative indicators. Of course, the goal behind creating these indicators is to standardize uh, the means through which 
one can compare the indicators, which is certainly a way for us uh, to become adapted to the international context so that we can participate in these indicators. Some examples of less tangible indicators, for instance, uh, ICT's capacity to retain researchers, entrepreneurs, the institution's reputation for innovation, the efforts of academic research, promotion of the ICT name. These are just a few examples of more qualitative indicators. However, the important thing about this, and I want to highlight this very clearly, is that more and more we've been seeing all over the world a movement towards putting more and more emphasis on the impact of technology transfer much more than the financial results produced by the activity. And for our friend from, from MIT, this is about impacts, not income. It's by means of the impact that ICTs prove their social relevance. Universities are motivated by their impact on the society, which is reached by means of a huge variety of routes and mechanisms. This is in the High Education Funding Council for England report. Uh, this is just out of the oven last September, where they did an analysis of the structure of exchange and knowledge exchange in the university and best practices when it comes to technology transfer. It's the impact that matters and not how much the university got from royalties, but how much that new knowledge had an impact on the society by means of a new product, a new drug, whatever product we're talking about. I talked about the Form Act, and these are some of its results, widely based on numbers, but uh, we are making good progress and evolving more because Form Act has been working directly with the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, and it's been uh, strongly working with the Fortech. And just for you to see, how much growth we saw in this area in the country. There was a 450% increase in the number of institutions that responded. The first year the information was collected, 2006, only 43 institutions had responded, whereas in 2014, as uh, last year's report tells us, there were 264. There was also a growth in the number of patents requested and granted between 2010 to 2014. There were 1,078 requested in 2010, 2,163 requested in 2014, 169 granted 2009, 2010, 350 granted in 2014, a significant increase uh, with uh, an almost twofold increase. Uh, the number of institutions that are requesting and uh, having patents granted in the country and abroad. From 100 to 161 institutions. And studies show that up to 2,000, only four ICTs had requested patents, whereas now we have 861 institutions having requested patents, as well as an increment in the number of R&D projects with companies and a growth in the number of contracts uh, involving technology. Between 2010 and 2014, it almost doubled. This is an another way to show the results. Or you can see that there is a linear growth the amount of contracts with different types, with exclusivity, no exclusivity, and so forth. And um, Angela, I make it a point that I want to mention this. Angela, we uh, once were talking as if everything could be put in the same bag as licensing re uh, resources. However, in 2015, we got the breakdown and greater clarity as to what uh, uh, all comes from royalties and what comes from R&D 
agreements. So uh, from the 338, most of it comes from R&D agreements and only 37 million come from licensing contracts. So this is what Formix Dynamism is all about, how we evolve and how we perfect ourselves in terms of advancements. And I'm almost at the end of my presentation. Undoubtedly, the advancements are absolutely perceptible. Behind the numbers, there's, of course, intention to raise awareness of, around intellectual property and technology transfer. Best results are necessarily associated to a greater number of assets. Uh, and by a higher number of assets, I mean amount and quality of the research carried out in our ICTs. The more research, the more quality, the more robust the results will be and the greater number of assets will be as well. And the more technology we're able to transfer, whether it is through know-how or through uh, patent uh, licensing or services or uh, software licensing, uh, the more we will learn about the practice, undoubtedly, this is a learn by doing process. The more opportunities we have to experiment with these processes, the more we will perfect our way of doing things. Another very important aspect, and that's something that we perceive very clearly, uh, even in international experiences. In the past, there was this huge focus on patents, whereas today, uh, by looking at all the reports, whether it is the uh, UTM report or uh, the UK Association's report, among others, uh, we are perceiving more and more that the trading of assets generated by the ICTs is not restricted to uh, licenses and patents only as shown and ratified by the UK report. Cooperative R&D projects with companies are still the main source of technology transfer because when companies look for ICTs, they do so uh, to try to develop something that will improve their technological capabilities and that ends up generating a technology technological transfer. So. Uh, with a few exceptions, uh, we can say in terms of advancement that the ICT company interaction has been generating a positive impact about the perception of the social relevance of the academia. But of course, these are advancements, uh, and we still have a few challenges ahead of us. The first one has to do with the its nature itself of uh, academic uh, research, which is the initial stage of uh, the results and experience has been sho showing us that when companies approach us, they usually come looking for products that are as close as possible to the finished products. And that's much more difficult when it comes to ICTs, which is made more difficult by the fact that in the country we have no financing lines that are specific uh, per technological risk for projects or te technologies that are already protected or that are developed to a certain extent, uh, which also leads to a lack of incentive to private investment due to the high risks involved. There are many technologies that at the lab stage are very uh, successful. And uh, when it comes to taking them to tests and to the industrial scale, they simply do not work. Uh, so there is a whole line of work inside this chain that's extremely costly, uh, which renders our actions much more difficult. Another aspect is the need uh, to streamline the administrative structure of ICTs. And generally speaking, ICTs are only prepared for teaching, research, and extension activities and are not prepared for innovation-related activities. And that's why we considered that uh, the NID, as a legal entity, uh, will provide ICTs with better conditions to ready their structures by placing more focus on innovation. 
And another aspect that's extremely challenging, and it still is, and that was mentioned by my predecessors, uh, is about the professional training of human resources for innovation. We're becoming increasingly more concerned about that. And in that aspect, Fortech, along with INPI, with their academy, and Fortech, with the professional master's program to train managers of intellectual property and technology transfer. That's an extremely important step to professionalize and to create a career for innovation managers. And finally, I have to say that the technology transfer is a process. Not all depends exclusively on the net. Of course, having a good management, that's a requirement if we want the activity to be successful. However, the amount and the quality of the results of the survey has a direct impact on the success of the technology transfer. If we do not have high quality research and increased transfer opportunities, If we have that, uh, we have a more successful basis for the technology transfer. Another aspect is that taking ideas to the market requires companies willing to support them and transform them into products. And when we look at the print tech data, um, the numbers carry us out because only 7.5% of the Brazilian companies reveal uh, say that they have implanted a new products in the domestic market and only 1.2% in the international market between 2009 and 2011. So the culture of innovation really needs to be fostered among companies. In practice, uh, this leads the knowledge that's developed at the ICTs to be underutilized by Brazilian companies. Another aspect that calls our attention, especially when we make international comparisons, is how small is the number of spin-off companies generating as a result of intellectual property. These opportunities are still pretty pretty much underutilized and by making a brief analysis of this process when we look into the aspects related to entrepreneurism and innovation in Brazil and the introduction of intellectual property and technology transfer at the ICTs you notice that these two movements walk in parallel and I would dare say that they have not yet met whereas abroad the experience started with intellectual property, and now when you look at the indicators, both of UTM and Praxis Unico, and I believe that that's also the case in France, even though I'm not familiar with their numbers, uh, increasingly more the licensing of technology is granted much more for the creation of spin-offs than for the consolidation of already existing companies. Undoubtedly, this is a huge challenge that we have in Brazil, which is to create companies based on international intellectual property. And finally, as a take-home message, I think it's uh, we're required to foster a convergence in the focus. Uh, to achieve more fluidity of all the players involved in the innovation processes, to optimize resources, to obtain practical results in the R&D processes in terms of new products and processes taken to the market. This is our biggest challenge as a result of this huge process to have more and more products that have technological content so that we can become more competitive in the international market. That's what I had. Thank you very much for your attention.